I'm Ann Makovic, and this is The Minute. Stanford's Tara Vanderveer has announced her retirement. She is the winningest basketball coach in NCAA history. She spent 38 years with Stanford, winning three national championships and taking the Cardinal to 14 Final Fours. Scientists are trying to figure out how to free this gray whale. Its tail is stuck in a fishing net. Scientists say it's been dragging it for hundreds of miles. This drone video was taken near Thornton Beach off the coast of Pacifica. No timeline on a potential rescue mission. And the race to replace Congresswoman Anna Eshoo might be headed toward a recount. That comes after Joe Simidian and Evan Lowe tied for second place. Registrars have received two official requests for a recount. And the registrar of voters will decide if that'll actually happen. The Bay Area's only primetime newscasts at 8 and 9 p.m. on the all-new Picks Plus, 44 Cable 12. Daytime highs today are sitting above average all throughout the Bay Area. We're in the 80s throughout the Santa Clara Valley, 70s near San Francisco, putting us about 7 degrees above average into this afternoon. And let's take a look at some other local communities. Up into the North Bay we go. Santa Rosa and Petaluma are in the upper 70s. We're seeing some 80s return into the forecast off into the East Bay like Concord and Antioch. It's a beautiful, warm spring, almost summer like day for some of us in the Bay Area, but it's still cool with that coastal influence moving in from offshore. Those breezy conditions near Half Moon Bay topping us off only at 63 degrees. Now I'm going to drop the temperatures and I want to show you what's happening for us because today, yes, it is warm and it's thanks to high pressure sitting just offshore. Now that system is also bringing in a mix of sun and clouds, but once we head into our weekend forecast, we're going to see rainy skies return into the Bay as another area of low pressure drops in from the Gulf of Alaska. Alaska. We saw this last week, by the way. Remember that cold front that brought in windy conditions and then a lot of rain for a little bit? We're seeing a very similar setup for us heading into our Friday night and Saturday morning forecast, and we can see that on Futurecast right here. Here's that mix of sun and clouds that we have throughout this afternoon. Once we head into our Thursday forecast, we'll get more 80s for our daytime highs, a little bit more clear conditions, which is going to be great. And then we zoom out to see that area of low pressure building its way in from offshore all throughout our Friday evening forecast. It circulates in a counterclockwise direction. You can see that just offshore of San Francisco into late Friday night. And by early Saturday morning, it's going to be a rainy one for us right around the corner. So let's dive more into that right now. Taking a look at the next seven days. Well, we're in store for some cool weather into the weekend forecast. Hold on tight to the 80s while we still have them. Luckily, that cold front moves through relatively quick, and we're left with more sunshine into early next week. By Sunday and Monday, we're going to be seeing daytime highs return into the 60s and then 70s by Tuesday. School safety is top of mind for a group of parents in San Jose. They are fighting to put some extra space between their kids' campuses and homeless encampments. As our Katie Nielsen reports, they say it is time the city steps in. For the past year and a half, um, we've been involved in some advocacy surrounding our school safety and security. Alfredo Hernandez is a senior at KIPP and says some of the people living in RVs have scared his classmates. She was catcalled by one of the unhoused residents living here and neighboring uh, our school. And that really, that really made me realize how severe this issue has gotten and how we need an immediate solution. Alfredo says the RV started parking around the school during the pandemic, and that's when the problems really started. He says he met with San Jose's mayor, Matt Mahan, to talk about the concerns. They were walking past RV encampments, sometimes being harassed on their way on and off campus, or having break-ins on campus, even found needles on their picnic tables. And they asked us, what is a city? can we do? The answer is apparently two new ordinances, one that would prevent tent encampments within 150 feet of a school, and the other would allow oversized vehicles and RVs to be towed if they posed a public safety risk, which includes being parked near schools. This is her house, she says. Mm -hmm. For those like Anna Guerrero, who lives in an RV parked next to the school, she says she started parking here a few weeks ago because she was out of options. We're here because we're struggling. We don't really have a place to go, you know, because there isn't really places where you can park. Anna says she wants to go to one of the county's safe parking sites, but her RV has been ticketed in the past to the point she can't renew her registration without paying all those past due parking tickets. And she can't park in a county safe parking lot until she gets her RV registered. We're just trying to survive. Yeah. I'm just trying to survive. We are not advocating for the criminalization of our unhoused neighbors. 
we are advocating for a solution that benefits both us, the students, and our safety, but also advocating for a solution that benefits our unhoused residents. So that ordinance sailed through the first reading with unanimous support. There's going to be a second reading later this month ahead of a final vote in mid-May. It is the end of an era in Bay Area sports. After nearly four decades at the helm of Stanford women's basketball team, legendary coach Tara Vanderveer is calling it a career. Her teams have played in the NCAA tournament every year since 1988. She was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame in 2011 and even coached Team USA in the 1996 Olympics. As Matt Lively reports, she is retiring after a 45-year career, 38 of those here in the Bay Area. She's been one of the biggest advocates for women's basketball over the last half century, and she's going to go down as one of the greatest coaches in the history of the sport. Vanderveer broke the NCAA record for all-time wins in college basketball, men or women's, just this past season. In her 38 years, she won three national championships and took the Cardinal to 14 Final Fours. She was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame in 2011, and her teams have played in the NCAA tournament every single year since 1988. Vanderveer said, quote, I've been spoiled to coach the best and brightest at one of the world's foremost institutions for nearly four decades. Stanford has already announced that negotiations have begun for assistant Kate Pay to take over the reins. She just finished her 17th year as an assistant with Stanford and also won a national championship as a Cardinal player back in 1992. And Pay actually just recently joked in a KPIX interview that she was born to be a Cardinal. She was quite literally born at Stanford Hospital. Stanford also announced that Vanderveer will remain with the program in an advisory role. A lot of, pe lot of people are showing appreciation and recognition to Vanderveer on social media. University of Miami women's basketball coach Katie Mayer says on X, so much respect and gratitude for Tara Vanderveer, a woman of impact who always retains her competitive joy and love for our great game. Tom Crane, former head coach for the Indiana men's basketball pro program, says the only thing more bucket list for me than seeing a Tara Vanderveer practice before the Final Four in Indy was her in our Indiana conference room talking basketball. And senior sports illustrated writer Pat Ford posted, what a career, what a leader and teacher, what a class act. Hope she keeps swimming her laps. We're going to have continuing coverage of Vanderveer's retirement. We'll bring you the latest on air on our website, kpix.com, and streaming right here on CBS News Bay Area. Still ahead here on CBS News Bay Area, librarians in one Bay Area city say they have encountered so many dangerous situations on the job, they could write more than just a book about it. We could fill a whole library with all these incidents. What they are demanding from the city. Plus, thousands of home insurance policies will not be renewed. A closer look at the Bay Area zip codes losing coverage. And an East Bay city taking action to honor the indigenous people who lived on the land for generations. I'm a pilot for the California Army National Guard. I fly Blackhawks here in the state. There is nothing that Jessica Birch can't do. She is dedicated. She's super fun. Jessica is remarkable. I like the idea of being able to serve the Northern Californian people out doing search and rescues, helping out with Cal Fire missions. And I also feel like I have a heart for service also when it comes to forecasting for our local area. I mean, getting people prepared for their day, that's a huge importance for me. Wake up with a morning edition, weekdays on KPIX.
It's a warm day for us today here in the Bay Area with upper 70s up in the North Bay, low 70s into San Francisco and 80s returning into the Bay Area all the way off into the East Bay near Antioch, Livermore, stretching down into the Santa Clara Valley. And yes, that puts us well above average, by the way, about 15 degrees above average this afternoon throughout the Santa Clara Valley with a mix of sun and clouds in the forecast for us all throughout the Bay Area today. We'll see sunnier skies tomorrow with more 80s in our inland areas and more 60s along the coast. But heading into this weekend, it doesn't matter where you live. We're all going to experience a cold front moving in, bringing in rainy skies and 50s for our daytime highs. And then we start to dry up and warm up into early next week. Well, dozens of San Francisco library workers are making some noise to draw attention to an issue they say has really gotten out of hand. We're talking about drugs and homelessness around libraries. This is video of them protesting in front of the Civic Center building yesterday, calling for more security at all branches. Our Amanda Harry spoke with librarians about the danger they've had to face while on the job. We were not trained to do this type of work in library school. Library workers across the city say they're being forced to do a lot more than recommend books. Every day, they're the ones making sure the libraries are safe. Nicole Termini Germain has been working in the San Francisco library system for more than 30 years. She says over the years, things have become worse and she fears someone is going to get hurt. We could fill a whole library with all these incidents. Termini Germain brought a stack of incident reports with her, all from the past month. She works as a branch manager at the Portola Children's Library. She says they bargained for a guard back in 2022 after they had an incident that could have become a tragedy. I have nightmares about this one to this day. I will never forget it. She says it was a normal day after school let out and the library was filled with small children. And then I saw a half-dressed half -dressed man, clearly mentally unstable, wielding a weapon. He was walking around the library, cussing at people and threatening to stab them. She called library security. They were across the city. 911 responders didn't show up. The burden to get rid of the man and keep the children safe fell on her. I got him out there and he started threatening a large group of preschoolers who were sitting on the floor and he was cussing at them and threatening them with this weapon. I, feeling that strong sense of duty to protect the people, stepped between the man with the weapon and the children. I stood between them. He was aiming it right at my chest and I said, no, thank you. If he had not left, I may not be standing here today. It's aggravating. Because, Jasmine is one of several unhoused residents camping on the streets outside the main library. She says library workers shouldn't be specifically concerned about people experiencing homelessness and someone in her situation who is trying to use the library should be allowed to do so. If a homeless person on drugs is going to the library, hey, I salute them, you know, at least they're trying to stimulate their mind. Spokesperson with SF Public Library says the security incidents are down 14% from last year and not all branches require dedicated security. But Termini Germain says the conditions on the street are keeping families away. I know a number of people who will not bring their children to this main library. I'm a parent, you know, and that breaks my heart. I don't even want to bring my children to the main library. Library workers tell us this picket is not the end. They're going to keep raising awareness until they have the tools to keep things safe. And it's not just San Francisco. Other Bay Area libraries have been dealing with security issues. In February, the city of Antioch hired private security to patrol the library on West 18th Street. The county also said it had planned to upgrade the fencing and add security cameras. Home insurance has become more costly here in California, particularly because of wildfires and climate change threatening to make those disasters even worse. Now, John Ramos reports many homeowners are going to be finding out their policies are not going to be renewed. This quiet neighborhood at the foot of Mount Diablo is one of many that is about to get a rude awakening about the state of homeowners insurance in California. Caballo Ranchero Drive in the township of Diablo near Danville is lined with lovely and expensive homes. But when Ron Agazarian moved here, he got a surprise from his insurance company, State Farm. When we purchased this house, we thought we would just roll over our policy from there to cover this home. 
and uh, they told us they wouldn't uh, insure out here. They were not writing policies in this area. His home is in the 94528 zip code, and in July, more than half of the 152 State Farm policyholders in the area will be told that their insurance will not be renewed. The company published a map showing where other non-renewals will take place, more than 30,000 across the state. Insurance broker Carl Sussman explains why this is happening. For some reason, State Farm kept writing, and they were not just writing, but they were writing in areas that most carriers would not have written in ever. So we were a bit perplexed what the move was, what the game plan was with that. So when State Farm's coming out now being the first one to actually start non-renewing homes in what are considered above average for fire risk, it doesn't surprise us too much. In one zip code in the Santa Cruz Mountains, more than 65% of policies will be ending, and in one near Santa Rosa, nearly 48%. But in the entire state, the area with the most policies being non-renewed is the small city of Orinda in Contra Costa County. More than 1,700 of the 3,100 state farm policies will not be continued. The changes are coming faster than the very fire everyone's worried about. Tom Stack is a local real estate agent and says finding home insurance in Orinda has become so erratic that he's advising people to look for coverage before they start house hunting. And the refrain is, I've never had a claim, I've had them 20, 30 years. People are insulted, disgusted, upset. Those who lose their insurance may have to join the California Fair Plan, the state's insurer of last resort. Besides being expensive, Sussman says the program has become so overwhelmed with applicants that it can now take weeks just to get a quote, and operators say one big wildfire could throw the whole thing into insolvency. When I say they have very few choices, I'm being kind. Some may literally have no choices. If they're too large for the California Fair Plan, then they're going to have to talk with a broker to try and get a policy that could be through Lloyd's of London. And we could be looking at premiums without exaggerating of 30, 40, $50,000 a year, you know, outrageous, but that's what happens. That's the, that's exactly what you expect to see when there's no competition, right? But he says there could be hope in the future. The state is looking to change regulations that would allow insurers to price policies on a home by home basis, something that's not currently allowed. Sussman says that should attract insurers back to the market again, allowing them to assess risk on more factors than just a zip code. State Farm says it will begin sending out notices to homeowners on July 3rd, but they point out that the non-renewal is not a cancellation. Current policyholders will retain coverage until their current contracts expire. At least a half a dozen other insurers, including Allstate, Farmers, and Nationwide, have taken similar action in pulling or limiting coverage, citing high costs and the threat of wildfires. Still ahead, honoring its history, how an East Bay city is now taking new steps to acknowledge the indigenous people who lived on that land for generations. So that's pretty cool that it's just part of our culture and our history, and it's up there on a sign for everyone to watch and see. And a reminder, you can stream CBS News Bay Area wherever, whenever. Catch all of our live newscasts plus news and weather updates throughout the day. You can find us on the free CBS News app or on Pluto TV. Why are more people turning to KPIX Late Night? Two reasons. Sarah and Stephen. Oh. The Late News with Sarah Donchi. Then The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Back with all new episodes. Really? Two shows you'll want to spend the night with. Then go to sleep knowing you won at TV. What? Record it. Stream it. Watch it live. The Late News and the all-new Late Show. Weeknights starting at 11 on KPIX.
It's a warm day for us today in the Bay Area with daytime highs topping off in the low 80s near San Jose and Los Gatos. This almost feels summer like in certain pockets of the Bay Area. Let's take the East Bay, for example, 82 near Livermore and Antioch, 75 in Oakland, despite the fact that we're seeing just a mix of sun and clouds into the afternoon hours today. It's a warm one for us throughout the Bay Area, but that's not going to be the case for too much longer. This high pressure system sitting just offshore is the reason why we're dealing with dry conditions and warm temperatures, but heading into our weekend for Forecast while low pressure moves in from the north, and that's bringing in a series of showers and some really cold, dense air from the Pacific Northwest stretching down just along our coastline, too. So, these 80s we have today quickly turning into 50s by Saturday with rainy skies, and then we clear up into Sunday afternoon with a gradual warm up into next week. It is becoming more of a common concept to see land acknowledgement statements adopted at universities, schools, and public buildings. But one city in the East Bay is taking it a step further. The city of Lafayette has just unveiled two projects to symbolize its commitment to honoring its indigenous heritage. Our Max Darrow caught up with a young woman who says it is a gesture that goes a long way. These words now painted on a utility box in downtown Lafayette. Any land acknowledgement is great. Mean a lot to Bella Stratford. It brings a feeling of pride that we are even here reading a land acknowledgement. I just um, feel so grateful that our city is doing this. Stratford was there as city leaders, including Vice Mayor Wei Tai Kwok, unveiled not just one, but two gestures of respect to honor the indigenous heritage and rich history of the land long before Lafayette existed. First, the utility box wrap with the city's official land acknowledgement statement and an illustration of Sacklin women. A land acknowledgement statement is basically recognizing where, our, where we are and what the, who the land originally belonged to. And second, two new street signs on Mount Diablo Boulevard that now also include tush talk. I mean, it's a, a loady word for Mount Diablo, so that's pretty cool that it's just part of our culture and our history, and it's up there on a sign for everyone to watch and see. It's just a sign, but it has so much more meaning behind that. Kwok says the city consulted with indigenous elders on the projects meant to pay respect to the Bay Miwok and Ohlone people. Indigenous communities lived here before and that their descendants continue to walk with us today in our communities and we should acknowledge their presence and in order to continue to honor and make their presence uh, known in our community we decided to honor them through the placement of some of these very public signage and history. Stratford's heritage is Cherokee. Although a different indigenous group than the ones recognized here in Lafayette, she feels empowered by and grateful for the gestures. I know, it looks great. From the city she's proud to call home. To like step outside of my doorstep and to see a native representation is really incredible. A huge step towards inclusivity and just like making our city more diverse. And I'm just so proud to say I'm a Lafayette member. Two signs of respect that she and city leaders hope others around the Bay Area will take note of and learn from. Stratford is a senior at Camp Olinda High School and she helped write her school's land acknowledgement statement. She's heading to Berkeley in the fall where she plans to major in Native American studies. Coming up in our next half hour here on CBS News Bay Area, a backyard building boom in the South Bay. We started looking into the idea of a garage and then that led us to an ADU. How so-called granny units are helping put a dent in San Jose's housing crisis. Plus, amid a staffing shortage, this Bay Area Police Department started paying new officers a huge signing bonus. But is it paying off? These are your neighborhoods. This is your world. CBS News Bay Area. And still ahead on KPI. With Juliet Goodrich. And the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell taking you to the day's top stories. Smart, comprehensive coverage and immersive weather like you've never seen it. Join Juliet Goodrich and Nora O'Donnell. Weeknights, 6 to 7.30 on KPIX.
Ann McEvick, and this is the minute. Legendary Stanford women's basketball coach Tara Vanderveer announced that she is going to be retiring. She is the winningest coach in NCAA history. She spent 38 years with Stanford, won three national championships, and led the Cardinal to 14 Final Fours. A man in Gilroy accused of booby trapping his house is due in court today. Police arrested 46-year-old Marcus Beck after a DUI crash. They say they found his loaded guns in that BMW, and later they say they found his house rigged with explosives. Beck is expected to enter a plea today. And police in Palo Alto, East Palo Alto, searching for the suspect in the city's second homicide of the year. An officer found that victim along Newell Road, not far from the Four Seasons Hotel yesterday. No word yet on how that person died. East Palo Alto recorded zero homicides in all of last year. The Bay Area's only primetime newscasts on PIX Plus 44 Cable 12. Daytime highs today are sitting above average all throughout the Bay Area. We're in the 80s throughout the Santa Clara Valley, 70s near San Francisco, putting us about 7 degrees above average into this afternoon. And let's take a look at some other local communities. Up into the North Bay we go. Santa Rosa and Petaluma are in the upper 70s. We're seeing some 80s return into the forecast off into the East Bay like Concord and Antioch. It's a beautiful, warm spring, almost summer like day for some of us in the Bay Area, but it's still cool with that coastal influence moving in from offshore. Those breezy conditions near Half Moon Bay topping us off only at 63 degrees. Now I'm going to drop the temperatures and I want to show you what's happening for us because today, yes, it is warm and it's thanks to high pressure sitting just offshore. Now that system is also bringing in a mix of sun and clouds, but once we head into our weekend forecast, we're going to see rainy skies return into the Bay as another area of low pressure drops in from the Gulf of Alaska. We saw this last week, by the way. Remember that cold front that brought in windy conditions and then a lot of rain for a little bit? We're seeing a very similar setup for us heading into our Friday night and Saturday morning forecast. And we can see that on Futurecast right here. Here's that mix of sun and clouds that we have throughout this afternoon. Once we head into our Thursday forecast, we'll get more 80s for our daytime highs, a little bit more clear conditions, which is going to be great. And then we zoom out to see that area of low pressure building its way in from offshore all throughout our Friday evening forecast. It circulates in a counterclockwise direction. You can see that just offshore of San Francisco into late Friday night. And by early Saturday morning, it's going to be a rainy one for us right around the corner. So let's dive more into that right now. Taking a look at the next seven days. Well, we're in store for some cool weather into the weekend forecast. Hold on tight to the 80s while we still have them. Luckily, that cold front moves through relatively quick and we're left with more sunshine into early next week by Sunday and Monday. We're going to be seeing daytime highs return into the 60s and then 70s by Tuesday. Tuesday. Public safety and police staffing are hot button issues across the Bay Area. Local departments still struggle to recruit officers. The Alameda Police Department made headlines last year with $75,000 hiring bonuses for new recruits. At the time, 30% of the positions inside the department were not filled, including a third of its 88 officer slots. So the question is, has it worked? Our Itai Had followed one of the department's newest members to find out. When Kayla Gronley was a little girl, a police officer helped her family during a particularly rough time. That positive interaction triggered a lifelong obsession with becoming a cop. Being able to have somebody really guide our family into a better situation um, really just made me feel good and it made me want to explore what that profession was like. Now, at 26, she's a newly minted police officer at the Alameda PD. But little did she know, that dream job would come with an unexpected bonus. It was very exciting and uh, very grateful to be able to have that. Last year, with nearly a third of its 88 sworn positions sitting vacant, the city of Alameda decided to do something rather unusual give new hires a $75,000 signing bonus, the highest in the nation. That's on top of a six-figure salary. Kayla was already considering Alameda along with other police departments when she heard about the bonus. And while she says the money wasn't the main factor in her decision, it definitely helped steer her in Alameda's direction. I would very much like to be a homeowner one day. So it was very nice to know that there would be a bonus that I would be able to essentially put down towards a house. There's a number of different things that come into play here. Nishant Joshi is Alameda's police chief. It's difficult to afford housing here in the Bay Area. And so knowing that that's 
a burden or an obstacle or something that people are going to struggle with, how can we as a police department, as leadership, come up with ways, creative ways to remove that? Police departments across the country are in the midst of an unprecedented staffing crisis. That's caused an arms race of sorts, with cities looking for out-of-the-box incentives to lure candidates. And it seems to be working. We went from a 30% vacancy rate to about 15%. And if all goes as planned, I expect our entire patrol division to be full by this summer. In the first quarter of 2024, Alameda has seen a noticeable drop in larceny, vandalism and fraud. Auto theft, which was up 114% last year, has gone down 17% since January. Another critical measure, the department's response time to crimes, has also gone down 34 seconds in the last year. Still, not everyone is on board with Alameda's bonus bonanza. We need to not treat police officers as if they are athletes or superstars. Jennifer Rakowski is an Alameda resident and a former member of the city's police oversight task force. She says Alameda is spending north of a million and a half dollars on these bonuses, while San Jose PD, a police force 10 times that of Alameda, is spending just 150,000. Alameda outspends 85% of law enforcement departments in the country. That was before we offered 75K in hiring bonuses. Alameda PD says it's funding the bonuses by reallocating unspent police salaries from last year. As for Kayla, her first day on patrol ended with an arrest of a car thief. My baby. And a grateful owner who was able to get his vehicle back. Definitely got into the job to make sure that I'm helping people out each day. So um, even little things like this are definitely a win. Winning the war on crime with more officers on the beat, courtesy of the Alameda Police Department's bonus round. So in order to qualify for the $75,000 bonus, new recruits have to commit to serving at least five years on the force. It is a trend that started in the North Bay. Now, Pinol has become the first city in the East Bay to ban new gas stations. The city council voted last week to put a new temporary moratorium in place, part of an effort to reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions. But some drivers we spoke with are not so happy about it. We should be able to be building gas stations as people need still need gas. I mean, we don't have, all of us don't have the opportunity to get electric cars. All of Napa County cities have passed gas station bans. Fairfax and San Anselmo and Marin County have similar measures. In San Jose, creating new housing is one of the top priorities and challenges. Under a state-approved plan, the city is promising to build more than 62,000 homes in the next seven years. Well, that certainly seems like a lofty goal. One particular type of construction is thriving. Arlen Ramirez takes us inside one of the hundreds of granny units popping up around the city. Well, there have been many building booms in San Jose over the years and the decades, but this one is different because it's taking place in the backyards of homes that are already built. Here in the backyard, we had an old carriage house that was taken down. When Mark Dane's 1890s Victorian was built, no one could have foreseen the housing crisis that would come to San Jose. And so, like a fast-growing number of homeowners, he turned part of his backyard into one small piece of the housing solution. We started looking into the idea of a garage, and then that led us to an ADU, uh, especially with the accelerated permitting process and everything. Workers are still putting the finishing touches on the project, a two-car garage with an 800-square-foot apartment above it. There's a living area and kitchen, a bathroom, a laundry room, plus a separate bedroom. Mark says it will be a flexible space, a work-from-home office for now, but it can be a future place for his parents, his kids as young adults, or even a rental. One year later from the time that we started the project, we have this beautiful garage, beautiful house. 
up here that we can use for whatever we need down the line. Mark took advantage of a 2017 San Jose policy change that streamlined the permitting process to allow the homes to be built faster. San Jose is a good place for this kind of thing to happen. There are a lot of lots that can really utilize an ADU. Stanley Acton has been a general contractor for decades, oh, yeah. but recently shifted his business to only focus on building ADUs, and he hasn't looked back. We're looking at uh, a backlog that extends well into 2025, but but we also have we also have the ability to take on short-term work. Stanley is one of several ADU specialist builders in San Jose who have pre-approved building plans from the city. If the property meets some basic criteria like being large enough and on level ground, pre-approved plans can make the process even faster. In six years, the city has issued 2,500 ADU permits and about 1,600 units have already been built. Just this year, 68 ADUs have been completed. These are not complicated, bespoke, risky projects. San Jose Mayor Matt Mahan says ADUs are becoming a bigger factor in San Jose's housing production. ADU applications in San Jose are on the order of a, of a quarter or more of the permit applications we're seeing right now. That's a significant share of the new housing production that we're seeing in, in San Jose. It's the flexibility of the space. You know, we love the options down the line, whether it be for our kids when they graduate college, or to have family over in a time of need. It's new housing that fits in an older neighborhood and fits the needs of one growing family. Typical costs for an ADU build run from $250,000 to half a million or more. And although they can produce thousands in monthly income for the owners who would rent them, they also do add to your property tax bill. Coming up next, a local zoo spent weeks nursing this little tiger back to health. And now she is getting a second chance to start over. I would like to see the headlines that the national press picks up on and say, look, there's another side to the Bay Area. We take those headlines a little step further to sort of connect all these wonderful communities here. Really embracing the positivity and hopefully spreading it. The Bay Area is full of some amazing, innovative change makers. People that are out there making a difference. In fact, I feel privileged that I get to share those stories. Wake up with a morning edition, weekdays on KPIX.
It's a warm day for us today here in the Bay Area with upper 70s up in the North Bay, low 70s into San Francisco and 80s returning into the Bay Area all the way off into the East Bay near Antioch, Livermore, stretching down into the Santa Clara Valley. And yes, that puts us well above average, by the way, about 15 degrees above average this afternoon throughout the Santa Clara Valley with a mix of sun and clouds in the forecast for us all throughout the Bay Area today. We'll see sunnier skies tomorrow with more 80s in our inland areas and more 60s along the coast. But heading into this weekend, it doesn't matter where you live. We're all going to experience a cold front moving in, bringing in rainy skies and 50s for our daytime highs. And then we start to dry up and warm up into early next week. Marine biologists are trying to figure out how to free a gray whale that is cruising up the Bay Area coast, dragging a load of fishing net and buoys behind it. This drone video shows the whale dragging that load of buoys off Thornton Beach in Pacifica yesterday. Apparently, the whale has been dragging that load for more than 400 miles. Scientists at NOAA told us that it was first spotted last month off Laguna Beach. Marine biologists put a tracker on it, but it failed and they lost the signal. The president of the Pacific Beach Coalition says it's actually amazing that the whale has made it this far. This particular whale is very lucky because it's able to pull that along. Sometimes they get dragged down and they can't get up. Or they get, you know, that buoy would get stuck on something and now they're trapped. And so they're paddling and not going anywhere and losing steam. And then right. they, they have to breathe. And so if they, you know, they run out of steam and they can't breathe, they're, they're gone. Oh, and here's a close up of the whale's tail. Noah believes that is a gill nut wrapped around it and it's not gonna be easy to get close enough to the whale to cut it free. You're literally right. in a little boat going up to a whale, you know, and diving into the water next to a whale that could kill you with the one swipe of its fin and literally cutting the, the rope off the whale. There's a big responsibility for us to, uh, to, to do everything in our power to help right. them. Oh, and at this time of year, gray whales migrate from the Gulf of Mexico up to Alaska. It's a long migration that's obviously even more difficult when you're pulling a net. No timeline yet on a potential rescue mission. Well, we have been following the story of Lily, the rescued tiger that got a second chance at the Oakland Zoo, and we've just learned that she has moved to her forever home. Lily first came to the Oakland Zoo in February at eight months old. She was in pretty bad shape. She had been rescued from a privately owned facility and had 10 fractures that had not healed properly, stopping her from being able to climb and run. The team at the Oakland Zoo discovered she also had a disease that can cause bones to weaken. But... They took on the challenge. They did everything they could to nurse her back to health, and the Oakland Zoo posted updates week by week. And we could see the change. She started to have some fun. She's pouncing in her enclosure, splashing in tubs of water, even playing with bubbles. Well, now that she's doing so much better, Lily was moved to the Paws Sanctuary in San Andreas, a permanent home for rescued tigers, elephants, bears, and wild animals. Well, coming up, we're going to meet a Bay Area student who juggled schoolwork with helping her parents become U.S. citizens. Now, she is hoping to help other families in a similar position. My parents did not have papers. When I went to school, I feared that someone was going to come and get them, especially with the political climate that was arising.
It's a warm day for us today in the Bay Area with daytime highs topping off in the low 80s near San Jose and Los Gatos. This almost feels summer like in certain pockets of the Bay Area. Let's take the East Bay, for example, 82 near Livermore and Antioch, 75 in Oakland, despite the fact that we're seeing just a mix of sun and clouds into the afternoon hours today. It's a warm one for us throughout the Bay Area, but that's not going to be the case for too much longer. This high pressure system sitting just offshore is the reason why we're dealing with dry conditions and warm temperatures, but heading into our weekend for Forecast while low pressure moves in from the north, and that's bringing in a series of showers and some really cold, dense air from the Pacific Northwest stretching down just along our coastline, too. So, these 80s we have today quickly turning into 50s by Saturday with rainy skies, and then we clear up into Sunday afternoon with a gradual warm up into next week. It is challenging enough to graduate from one of the most prestigious schools in the country when you're the first in your college, or first in your family, rather, to go to college. But imagine doing that while also trying to protect your parents from being deported. In today's Students Rising Above, our Elizabeth Cook met a young woman who found success and strength through life's toughest moments. Ruby Lopez walks the campus of UC Berkeley with an extra pep in her step. She's just a few months away from graduation and she's got big dreams and a bright outlook on her future. But four years ago, this moment didn't seem possible. First, I had never really heard anything about UC Berkeley in the area that I grew up. It was kind of rare for anyone to actually go to college. Ruby has always carried a heavy load in school and in life. Growing up, money was tight and she always lived in fear. One day, her parents could be taken away. I was constantly scared that because my parents did not have papers, when I went to school, I feared that someone was going to come and get them, especially with the political climate that was arising. And because of that, I spent a lot of my time not only devoted to school, but also devoted to the safety of my family, especially living in an area like San Jose. As a young child, she would juggle doing her homework with helping her parents navigate getting their citizenship. I would sit there and try and translate um, documents and attempt to encourage them to go and actually get their citizenship or residency, and eventually it did get to that point. The constant stress took its toll. And it wasn't until I actually got to college that I actually dissected those feelings and realized why I was exhausted all the time because not only was I taking care of myself, but I was also taking into account my parents and my siblings. When she started her freshman year in 2020, Ruby hit a breaking point. It was probably one of the lowest points in my life. It was the middle of COVID, and even at a place like UC Berkeley, Ruby struggled to find students who looked like her. I struggled to find other Latinas or other Latinos in general, and that made me feel like I wasn't seen on campus because everyone around me didn't look like me. So it discouraged me from actually feeling like I belonged here, which just implemented imposter syndrome that I had a hard time dealing with. She almost dropped out, but her students rising above advisor convinced her it was time to put herself first. Because for as long as I can remember, Academics never really came hard to me necessarily, but advocating for myself always came super difficult to me. <laughs> and something else happened that would change everything. I clicked with Ruby immediately because I, we had the same sense of humor. She met Hatikva Robles at a work-study program, a best friend who knows what it's like to be a child of immigrant parents. Where we felt that pressure to be successful and do things the correct way to fulfill an American dream that our parents had for us. Ruby is getting her degree in legal studies with an emphasis in immigration and has plans to go to law school so she can help other families navigate getting their citizenship. We but even more than that, so well she wants to write a new chapter in her family's sure. story. <laughs> That's really the bigger picture of why I keep going, because of the fact that I know I have other people around me that are looking at me and seeing what my next step is. Whatever that next step is, Ruby knows she won't be making it alone. Pretty amazing. Now for a look at some of today's most talked about stories. A father and daughter got a unique view of this week's eclipse. Just as the sky over Texas was getting dark, the pair did this tandem skydive, free falling from the shadow of the eclipse. Once the shoots deployed, they got a chance to take in the epic event. The daughter says it was the coolest thing they've ever done.
Might be time to plan a vacation to a national park. They are waiving entrance fees on April 20th. But as part of National Park Week, it's normally $35 a car to enter Yosemite because the 20th is on a Saturday. You do still have to make a reservation to the park. And check this out, runaway horse. Surprising people at a train station in Sydney. It looked like at one point the horse was waiting for the train. He even stayed behind the yellow line. He was eventually caught by his owners. Local news in Australia says the station is near a racetrack, but it's not clear if that is where the horse came from. Well, thanks for streaming CBS News Bay Area. I'm Ann Makovic. We're going to be right back with your first alert forecast and another look at your top stories. And this is the minute. Stanford's Tara Vanderveer has announced her retirement. She is the winningest basketball coach in NCAA history. She spent 38 years with Stanford, winning three national championships and taking the Cardinal to 14 Final Fours. Scientists are trying to figure out how to free this gray whale. Its tail is stuck in a fishing net. Scientists say it's been dragging it for hundreds of miles. This drone video was taken near Thornton Beach off the coast of Pacifica. No timeline on a potential rescue mission. And the race to replace Congresswoman Anna Eshoo might be headed toward a recount. That comes after Joe Simidian and Evan Lowe tied for second place. Registrars have received two official requests for a recount. And the registrar of voters will decide if that will actually happen. The Bay Area's only primetime newscast at 8 and 9 p.m. on the all-new PIX Plus. 44 Cable 12. Daytime highs today are sitting above average all throughout the Bay Area. We're in the 80s throughout the Santa Clara Valley, 70s near San Francisco, putting us about 7 degrees above average into this afternoon. And let's take a look at some other local communities. Up into the North Bay we go. Santa Rosa and Petaluma are in the upper 70s. We're seeing some 80s return into the forecast off into the East Bay like Concord and Antioch. It's a beautiful, warm spring, almost summer like day for some of us in the Bay Area, but it's still cool with that coastal influence moving in from offshore. Those breezy conditions near Half Moon Bay topping us off only at 63 degrees. Now I'm going to drop the temperatures and I want to show you what's happening for us because today, yes, it is warm and it's thanks to high pressure sitting just offshore. Now that system is also bringing in a mix of sun and clouds, but once we head into our weekend forecast, we're going to see rainy skies return into the Bay as another area of low pressure drops in from the Gulf of Alaska. 
Alaska. We saw this last week, by the way. Remember that cold front that brought in windy conditions and then a lot of rain for a little bit? We're seeing a very similar setup for us heading into our Friday night and Saturday morning forecast, and we can see that on Futurecast right here. Here's that mix of sun and clouds that we have throughout this afternoon. Once we head into our Thursday forecast, we'll get more 80s for our daytime highs, a little bit more clear conditions, which is going to be great. And then we zoom out to see that area of low pressure building its way in from offshore all throughout our Friday evening forecast. It circulates in a counterclockwise direction. You can see that just offshore of San Francisco into late Friday night. And by early Saturday morning, it's going to be a rainy one for us right around the corner. So let's dive more into that right now. Taking a look at the next seven days. Well, we're in store for some cool weather into the weekend forecast. Hold on tight to the 80s while we still have them. Luckily, that cold front moves through relatively quick and we're left with more sunshine into early next week by Sunday and Monday. We're going to be seeing daytime highs return into the 60s and then 70s by Tuesday. School safety is top of mind for a group of parents in San Jose. They are fighting to put some extra space between their kids' campuses and homeless encampments. As our Katie Nielsen reports, they say it is time the city steps in. For the past year and a half, um, we've been involved in some advocacy surrounding our school safety and security. Alfredo Hernandez is a senior at KIPP and says some of the people living in RVs have scared his classmates. She was catcalled by one of the unhoused residents living here and neighboring uh, our school. And that really, that really made me realize how severe this issue has gotten and how we need an immediate solution. Alfredo says the RV started parking around the school during the pandemic, and that's when the problems really started. He says he met with San Jose's mayor, Matt Mahan, to talk about the concerns. They were walking past RV encampments, sometimes being harassed on their way on and off campus, or having break-ins on campus, even found needles on their picnic tables, and they asked us, what is a city? can we do? The answer is apparently two new ordinances, one that would prevent tent encampments within 150 feet of a school, and the other would allow oversized vehicles and RVs to be towed if they posed a public safety risk, which includes being parked near schools. This is her house, she says. Mm -hmm. For those like Anna Guerrero, who lives in an RV parked next to the school, she says she started parking here a few weeks ago because she was out of options. We're here because we're struggling. We don't really have a place to go, you know, because there isn't really places where you can park. Anna says she wants to go to one of the county's safe parking sites, but her RV has been ticketed in the past to the point she can't renew her registration without paying all those past due parking tickets. And she can't park in a county safe parking lot until she gets her RV registered. We're just trying to survive. Yeah. I'm just trying to survive. We are not advocating for the criminalization of our unhoused neighbors. We are advocating for a solution that benefits both us, the students, and our safety, but also advocating for a solution that benefits our unhoused residents.